when we suggested we defer harvesting, we said in those areas where we have so few of these ecosystems left that we really just need to hang on to them right now till we come up with a way of managing for ecosystem health and keep this whole landscape healthy. Because if you take those last remnants, you have nothing left to work with. You can't grow old growth. Old growth is old trees, but they exist on thousands of year old ecosystems. And today with climate change and everything else like that, it's very unlikely you're going to grow old growth again. This is not a renewable resource. The trees, okay. yeah, you can grow big trees again, but you cannot, if you use conventional clear cutting and the types of systems that we're using now, you cannot regrow that stuff. You can gotcha. grow something that maybe looks like it a little bit, but a 500 year old fir stand sitting on a ecosystem that was heavily logged and burned would look very different than a 500 year old fir stand that's sitting on a 3,000 or 4,000 year old ecosystem. Hey folks, what's happening? Welcome to your forest. My name is Matthew Kristoff, and on this podcast, we talk about the environment and the science of sustainability. Now, today's episode was one hell of a doozy. You can probably see that from the fact that it's, uh, you know, pushing two and a half hours long. Uh, and that was because it was very action packed, full of information, full of uh, learning opportunities. And it was probably the most complex but most engaging conversation on sustainable forest management that I've ever had. So you guys are definitely going to like it. Uh, listen to it in parts if you can, if you have to, but uh, definitely check out the whole thing. It's all worth listening to. Um, yeah, it was really, really enjoyable. So the conversation is about old growth, as you see by the title. Uh I've been trying to figure out how to have this conversation for quite some time. I was kind of nervous about it. Don't know where to begin because there's a lot to talk about. Now, uh, I reached out to a gentleman named David Anderson, who's been on the podcast before. And uh, he's in that world of research and old growth and sustainable forest management, you know, futures kind of thing. And so he pushed me in the direction of some people. And we ended up with an awesome cast that I could not be more stoked about. Uh, firstly... We have John Innes. John Innes is a professor at the UBC Faculty of Forestry. He was the dean of that faculty, but just left that role like two weeks ago. And uh, he also is involved with a lot of research regarding sustainable forest management, uh, the future of sustainable forest management, Aboriginal forestry, climate change research, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Second person is Andy McKinnon. Now, Andy is an ecologist that worked for the BC Forest Service for three decades, who's involved in previous old growth reviews, and he's wrote all kinds of papers on all kinds of ecological stuff, very involved with old growth research and that kind of thing. And uh, also, for me, his name stood out because he helped write a lot of those plant Bibles that we all have. Check out your plant book. His name is Good chance it's on there if you're from you know your plot books for like Alberta, BC, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so we, I wanted him here to speak to the ecology of it. And lastly was Gary Merkel. Uh, Gary Merkel, he is a member of Taltan First Nations, and he is also an RPF. All three of these guys are RPFs, actually. Um, but Gary, uh, he his most latest accomplishment that ties him into old growth is him and Al Gorley actually wrote the most recent old growth review, the strategic review, uh, they went out and listened to all these communities, all these stakeholders, spent a bunch of time going through it all, going through the data, trying to figure out what the next step is. It really is an incredible feat. I encourage anyone that wants to know about a lot of the concepts we talk about in this episode to go here. It's called A New Future for Old Forests, a strategic review of how British Columbia manages for old forests within its ancient ecosystems. Uh, really incredible. We talk about it a bunch. So definitely at least look it up and you can see some of the infographs and that kind of thing. Um, so all three of these people have done so much for forest 
management and for ecology and for furthering our society and understanding our relationship to nature better. And this conversation is great. You guys are going to love it. I'm going to stop talking now because it's long enough as it is. Sponsors. The opinions on this show should not be considered to be those of the sponsors. They are just ideas to be contemplated and enjoyed. So sponsors are the same as always. Wes Fraser is the number one. Thank you so much, Wes Fraser, for all that you've done. I really appreciate your support. Uh, Secondly is GreenLink Forestry. Been with me since the beginning. Cannot thank them enough for all they've done for me. Thank you, GreenLink. And also Damaged Timber. Damaged Timber is a company selling cool stuff that you can put in your kitchen. They go out into the bush. They cut down wildfire burnt trees and turn it into stuff you can put in your kitchen. It's awesome. Check them out. DamagedTimber.com. Put in your forest tent at checkout to get 10% off. Now, let's do this. Old growth. Here we go. I like to start these things off always by getting to know you guys a little bit, understanding kind of your driver for doing the work that you do, right? So uh, I'll I'll start off with Andy, uh, just because you're first on my screen on the left. And uh, uh, why do you do the work that you do? And and, and why have you done it for so long? What, What is the value that you see in it? Well, I've worked as a forest ecologist uh, since the 1980s, which I guess is a really long period of time. And (laughs) uh, I've been involved in a program of ecosystem classification and mapping, but also forest research. And a lot of the research projects I was involved with were uh, characterizing the structure and, and composition of old growth and second growth forests in different parts of the province. Uh, A lot of the work over the last two decades has been on BC's coast and in the wet belt interior. Mm -hmm. And from that experience, I, um, I gained an appreciation, not just for how some, how magnificent some of these forests are, but also for the incredible differences between old growth and second growth forests in structure, composition, and function in different parts of BC. And so I was actually, I chaired the research and inventory group uh, when BC developed an old growth strategy in the early 1990s. Mm. Uh, So the government has been at this process of trying to decide how to properly address issues around old growth for many decades now, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, we can come back to that if people are interested. But uh, <laughs> but that that uh, that's how I came to be um, interested in old growth forests. Gotcha. And uh, and certainly in the last fifteen years or so, rather a, an outspoken advocate for the need to change land use and forest management uh, in British Columbia. Gotcha. Yeah, not to mention you've written all the plant Bibles that we all go off of constantly. Oh, so, <laughs> I, and, and and I did uh, because I was interested in alternate models. I did take five years off from my work with research in the Forest Service to uh, work as a government technical person uh, on the development of land use plans for Haida Gwaii and the Great Bear Rainforest, mm. um, which I think provide some models for how we uh, might want to uh, work on planning in different parts of the province. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that, Andy. Appreciate it. And then, uh, so yeah, John, you, you next, what, why do you do the work that you do? Why is it important? Why have you dedicated so much of your time to, to doing this, this work? Well, thank you. Those are questions that I ask myself pretty often. Um, <clears throat> a good so I, I grew up in the UK and uh, particularly I grew up in Scotland. Uh, I worked for the UK Forestry Commission for a while, but I wasn't really very keen on what they were doing and moved to Switzerland back in 1992 and worked in Switzerland for seven years before coming to British Columbia in 1999. Um, I had not been to BC prior to my arrival here as the Chair of Forest Management. Um, I've been at UBC ever since, and 
I've been working on forest management issues, looking at various different problems. Um, many of the issues I've been looking at are associated with the relationship between forestry companies and First Nations and between the government and First Nations. And so I've worked firstly in the Northeast, um, in the area, Treaty 8 area, and then with a variety of different First Nations all the way through BC um, in Central Interior on the coast and elsewhere. I became Dean of Forestry in 2010 and stepped down from that post what, 12 days ago, mm -hmm. uh, 13 <laughs> days ago. Um, and I'm just enjoying now the freedom that I have since I stepped down. Uh, <laughs> while I was Dean, I um, was interested in a variety of different areas. One of them was um, ensuring that science is promoted wherever possible and that science is used as much as is feasible in decision-making and in policy-making. Um, I mostly worked outside of British Columbia. Um, I found it very difficult to get science onto the political agenda here um, and into the decision-making process, but um, it was much easier in a variety of other places, including Australia and China, where I've spent a lot of time. Um, I was interested in the old growth debate because I was kind of thrown into it from my position as dean. I had a lot of faculty members saying that I needed to take a, uh, a position. No one specified what that position was. And when I tried to work it out, someone were saying, well, you should be supporting the forest industry. Others were saying you should be supporting the government. Some were saying you should be supporting First Nations, and some were saying you should be supporting the environmental lobby. And uh, my feeling as a dean was that we really needed to take a step back and uh, let individuals do what they want, while in my case, I was essentially uh, making sure that there was always a platform for people to speak um, their views, however popular or unpopular their views might be. Mm. Yeah, well, that makes sense. You don't want to silence those voices, make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to speak their truth. Yeah, everyone's, regardless of how backed up their their reasons might be, it's important to to hear it all for sure. I get yeah. it. And awesome. I know, just finish off by saying, I know if I had to describe myself, you know, what's my field, I'd probably say forest ecologist is the closest, although I've delved into many different aspects. I, my first papers were on lichens, and he probably knows that. I don't know. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, and uh, <clears throat> since then, I've, I've worked on a huge range of other issues. Um, I came to BC because I was so impressed with the forests. I mean, the forests are magnificent here. Um, I went to Carmana very early on and Walbran. Uh, after arriving, was shown them by some people. I've been to the Haida Gwaii. In fact, I've been all over the province and uh, I'm very impressed by the forests and also concerned about some of the forestry practices that I see. In fact, about a lot of the forestry practices I see. Mm, mm. That's yeah, that's, that's hard to hear. I, uh, yeah, I know. I appreciate that honesty because it's, it's, it's hard to, I myself, like being in Alberta, I don't know a lot about what's going on in BC forestry wise, but in Alberta, I tend to, I think I tend to see it always, very optimistically and i don't know how accurate my view actually is <laughs> so it's uh it's always good to hear what people in the in, in other parts of canada are, are are feeling and thinking about it right so uh yeah thanks john and then uh finally gary uh i, I want to get your reasoning your why why is this important to you why have you spent a lifetime doing this work yeah, well, this work is a little bit broader than old growth, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I I was thinking about it for a minute, and when I was I was in Ottawa when I was young, and I was working building forest cover maps. It was it was a bit of a fluke that I ended up there because I was going somewhere else, but I needed to stop and make some money, and a friend of mine offered me this job, and so. While I was doing this job, one of the fellows I worked with, he was a photo interpreter, 
he says to me, he says, um, he says, you know, you should think about going to school. He says, because you can go to school for two years and you can become an area director. And there's like four of these in the Yukon, and they're the supreme person for all land-related stuff in the Yukon. And that's where I, where I was born and mostly raised. And I thought, holy crap, that's a that's a dream job. Like I can't even believe that. Two years, that's all I got to do. Yeah, yeah. So I so I started to work that way. I mean, I never ended up in that job, but I ended up in lots of others. And uh, so my work is mostly around uh, empowering communities to envision and shape their own futures. Mm. And it mostly has to do with land uh, and ecology. But this work in particular, I've always been involved in public policy a lot. And it was a bit serendipitous, I guess, that I ended up in this old growth stuff. Uh, Just the same as everything else in my life. I've worked in many, many different areas, but... The old growth for me is um, like a lot of my work has to do with how do we manage for ecosystem health and how do we become more, how do we live in our place better in the land? And it turns out that old growth is a really critical component of ecosystem health at a, at a local and a landscape level. And uh, so it's not just about the prettiness or the, whatever of the old trees, they actually serve a really critical function in keeping our land healthy um, uh, in so many different ways that uh, they're, they're, um, they're a very powerful tool in managing the health of the land along with a few other things. So that's kind of what I, where I've ended up with them uh, as part of my life now. It's just a mm-hmm. big part of my life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially after the the strategic review, I imagine you probably get a lot of phone calls. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, one or two. <laughs> so, so yeah, I want thanks for thanks for giving your two cents, everyone. I just wanted to kind of get that out there so people know what your voices sound like, kind of know your background a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, I started this whole journey um, by asking a colleague, David Anderson, about like, who do I talk to about this old growth issue. Right? How do I how do I get some objective or reasonable, comprehensive viewpoints to talk about this subject? Because I feel it's an incredibly important subject that there's a lot of focus on. Right? I mean, a lot of a lot of articles have pointed towards old growth as akin to the loss of the Great Barrier Reefs and um, the rainforests and the Amazon and that kind of thing. And so, this is one of those those totems in our society of, uh, yeah, this is something that could go away and maybe not, might not come back. So I wanted to, to do it justice from, from as many perspectives as possible. So, um, you guys are the ones that, that after a lot of back and forth and, and, and trying to figure out who's the right, you guys are the ones we landed on. And I couldn't be more excited to have the three of you on here today to try and, to try and delve into this discussion. Um, and, and try to, I think our job today is to try and, at least in my mind, to provide some context um, and hopefully some clarity toward around this topic. Um, at least on my part, I find I've I've done a lot of reading and listening and trying to understand it, and I still find myself confused about the details of it. Right. Um, so, I want to start this whole conversation by just trying to define exactly what it is we're talking about, right? Defining old growth, because there's a lot of definitions and you're all smiling. <laughs> so I find that funny. <laughs> and, uh, and I get it because there's, there's a bunch of different definitions and a bunch of different numbers out there. And so let's start by narrowing this down. How much is there now? I think Gary, you're probably the best suited to talk about this considering you have spent the last, I don't know how long, um, creating this a new futures for old forest, the strategic review. So there was an independent panel, you and and uh, and Al Gorley. Uh, you guys were 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 given this by the government to go over this, and you guys went around to communities and you interviewed people, and you uh, you said something about in one article I read about um, you didn't want to write anything down until you were finished the listening phase, and I thought that was awesome because you wanted to try to gather as many perspectives as possible. So. 
Gary, I'll start with you. And again, I want this to be an open discussion. So if anyone wants to just add on to what Gary's saying or, or, or differentiate, feel free to jump in whenever. Um, how, how would you define old growth in this context? Old growth really is just more of a state that an ecosystem lives in. It, it, uh, it has to do with uh, the age of the ecosystem, not like you can have an old growth uh, grassland, you can have an old growth marine complex, you can have an old growth forest, you can have old growth in anything. And it really describes uh, a, a, a system that has grown to a point where it started to take on a lot of its own unique attributes and own unique properties it, that become really um, um, important and actually critical for the larger landscape. Um, you, you know, I could pick maybe an old growth uh, uh, beaver dam valley, something that has been dammed by beavers for hundreds, if not thousands of years. It turns into this incredible complex of bogs and 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 grasslands and uh, brush and old big trees and that that whole rit it becomes very very rich and complex because of all of the things that are in it and because of that richness and complexity and it's tied to other old pieces in the landscape now many many things can live in there it's, it's lost its simplicity and it's mm. grown into something very complex so that that's mm. the easiest way I could describe it okay. Excellent. Thank you. So I, I want to try to break it down even further to understand it because um, like more specifically, uh, the government of BC has come out and said, okay, there's 13.2 million hectares of old growth. Um, and then meanwhile, uh, another paper came out um, talking about, uh, I believe it was with Rachel Holt and a couple of her colleagues saying there's only about 35,000 hectares of old growth left in the, on the landscape. So I want to try to narrow down for the context of this conversation of, of protecting old growth. Um, is there, is there an age that we're talking about? Is there a size? Cause I think there's been this discussion about, okay, is it old growth or is it big growth or is it like, what is the, what are the attributes that require it to be put into a different category than mature growth or, or some other, some other thing. Right. Um, I'm not sure any, who wants to take that on, maybe Gary or Andy or whoever, whoever feels comfortable. I'm, I'm happy to jump Andy, in go ahead. and then others can, uh, can correct me if they'd prefer. Um, but uh, certainly this is something we were grappling with back in the 1990s and decided that we actually needed a number of different definitions of old growth for different purposes. Okay. I think Gary's definition is a good one. Um, to give you an example of what I'm talking about, we needed a definition that was so all-encompassing that everybody could agree uh, that this was what we were talking about which at the same time rendered it absolutely useless for anything like inventory or uh, statistics. <laughs> oh, no. um, at the other end of the spectrum is one way of looking at it. We came up with definitions that were strictly aged-based. So there's not that much information available in our forest inventory and our vegetation resources inventory maps for British Columbia, but certainly age, stand age is one of them. So we defined forests above 250 years in some of the wetter parts of the province and above 141 years in some of the drier parts of the province as being old growth. And that allows you to say, we have this many hectares that's older than 250 years, this many hectares that's younger than 141 mm -hmm. years. We called it an inventory definition simply because it's one of the ones that could be applied and give you an answer to how much is there. Mm. Um, one of the problems with that, oh, and, and there were also detailed structural definitions that have been developed for some parts of the province so that people can go into a stand, measure heights, DBHs, live and dead trees and things like that, and say, yes, 
Um, this has been done in the Central Coast, for example, in the South Central Coast order, be able to say, yes, this is an old stand or no, it's not. Mm -hmm. And they're uh, detailed uh, measurements of stems per hectare, live and dead, height, diameter, dead wood on the ground, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, the, a lot of the, the numbers that fly back and forth in British Columbia are from people who are using strict age-based criteria. And one of the, the things that we find on the coast of British Columbia is there are lots of types of ecosystems at high elevation and in wetlands that can be very old indeed, that can meet the age criterion, but that oftentimes will have trees that aren't much taller than you or me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And these aren't the stands that people are fighting over. Mm -hmm. But when you hear industry and government say we've got lots left and the environmental groups say we've got very little left, uh, the lots left is simply everything that's older than 250 years. The mm -hmm. little left is stuff that's over 250 years but can grow big trees. Oh. And so when you see two sets of numbers fly back and forth like that. Uh, so it was the paper by Gary's um, – colleagues in his current advisory group that uh, said, sure, there's lots of 250 plus year forest left on the coast, but a lot of it has very small trees on it and always will. And these sites that are capable of growing large trees, what a lot of people think of as old growth forests, are really limited in their extent and disappearing mm. quickly. Mm. And so, uh, that's one of the tasks that uh, uh, Gary and his current group have been tasked uh, with, uh, with defining, mapping, and making recommendations about is where are these, these old growth forests that can actually grow big trees in British gotcha. Columbia? Yeah, and that, that makes sense, right? That's where the, I feel the, the emotion is coming from, and that's where the, a lot of the public buy-in is coming from, right? Is, is this, this draw on these big, magnificent, cathedral like trees that are that are just very unique and like you said um sparse now right so um and i and i got the gist from reading through gary I, I should sorry Matthew, oh, sorry, there's one thing i i ought to to yeah. add it's Absolutely. compounded somewhat by the fact that um high elevation areas and wetlands places that can't grow trees very well are grossly overrepresented in our existing protected areas uh, uh, I think of something like Strathcona Park. I think of a lot of the protests around Clackwood Sound took place after the government agreed to protect a third of it, but it was essentially the third that couldn't grow a tree to save its life. <laughs> um, so, so in addition to there being lots of um, relatively unproductive old growth forests, mm -hmm. uh, an awful lot of it, most of it really, is in existing protected areas. So when people cite statistics, they'll say, well, you know, a high percentage of our protected, of our old growth is in protected areas. Um, and that's true, but a lot of it is this lower productivity uh, forest type. Okay. No, I appreciate that. And I, yeah, and I want to get past the numbers at some point here and get into the like, you know, the values discussion and that kind of thing. I just want to get this out of the way so that everyone listening has a clear picture of what we're talking about, right? Um, so I feel, uh, Gary, in the, in the review, the strategic review that you were a part of, um, you guys had a breakdown and I, I want to just talk about the numbers for a second. Um, and you tied it into the unproductive and um, inoperable landscapes and that kind of thing. So in total, it was said that there is... 13.2 million hectares of old growth in British Columbia. 4.4 million of it was protected. So that leaves 8.8 .8 million left. Um, and then in total, you also said that 80% of the 13.2 million hectares was either inoperable or low productivity and would never really be um, a target for, 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 for harvest. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong and, and if I'm totally reducing this argument to something less than what it is. Um, there's about 1.7, 1.76 million hectares remain that could be harvested that would be considered old growth. Um, does that sound about right? Is that where all of this argument is coming down to about um, what needs to be left alone and what doesn't? Is it that 1.7 million or is there a different? I, I'm just trying to paint a clear picture for people of like what we're talking about here. 
Um, it depends on why you want to protect it. Um, hmm. So um, the big, iconic, rich, complex ecosystems that we see the pictures of, the big Douglas fir and et cetera, those types of things, the big Sitka spruce, the big mostly coastal but interior temperate rainforest have a lot of these too. They're, they're, um, these, these ecosystems have a number of values, spiritual values, uh, cultural values. They're really important for keeping clean water, keeping local climate. Uh, they have a huge amount of um, genetic stock that could be very important for us as we're trying to adapt our forests through time. But one of the things they do is that they're really critical in terms of, as I explained earlier, the larger landscape health. And But these things tend to be located in easily accessible areas in the valley bottoms in close proximity to centers. So the thing is, is most of these are gone now. So it's not, it's not the larger number. Mm. If you manage ecosystems, one of the things you manage for is you try to minimize your biodiversity risk. And what mm -hmm. that means is as you lose the older components of your profile, you start to lose species and functions in the landscape and you incur more and more risk of losing biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Once you start getting below 30% roughly, of the inherent old parts of the forest left, you have reached your maximum biodiversity risk. You're very likely going to use, lose major mammal species, a number of smaller species. Your forest is going to start to become a monoculture, become much more um, susceptible to disease and uh, a whole bunch of other things. You're going to start to lose some of your critical ecosystem functioning you, you essentially turn from a very rich complex to more of a managed, sterile type environment. And that happens at a, quite a large scale. Mm -hmm. We, when we suggested we defer harvesting, we said in those areas where we have so few of these ecosystems left that mm -hmm. we really just need to hang on to them right now till we come up with a way of managing for ecosystem health and keep this whole landscape healthy. Because if you take those last remnants, you have nothing left to work with. You can't grow old growth. Old growth, old growth is old trees, but they exist on thousands of year old ecosystems. And today with climate change and everything else like that, it's very unlikely you're going to grow old growth again. This is not a renewable resource. The trees, okay. yeah, you can grow big trees again, but you cannot, if you use conventional clear cutting and the types of systems that we're using now, you cannot regrow that stuff. You can gotcha. grow something that maybe looks like it a little bit, but a 500 year old fir stand sitting on an ecosystem that was heavily logged and burned would look very different than a 500 year old fir stand that's sitting on a 3000 or 4000 year old ecosystem hmm. and function very different in a landscape. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a very complicated discussion. Like you, you, you made the distinction between old ecosystems and old forests, right? So, it, um, I go off on a slightly little bit of a tangent here. Um, how how would you define an old ecosystem versus an old forest? Then, because you said the old trees versus an old ecosystem. Um, so, if I guess these old, these ancient growth trees, kind of thing. Um, they are, they don't go through the same fire regime that the, you know, the rest of the province goes through. They're, they're relatively unaffected by, by large catastrophic fires. Is that kind of the idea? Cause my, my whole, my whole thought is that I, I want to try and differentiate these, um, disturbances, right? Because if, if disturbance is the concern, um, like an old ecosystem that burns, that old ecosystem has burned before. It's not; st it is still an old ecosystem, is it not? Or is there a different definition? Um, I'll, I'll answer, and then I'll let somebody else talk for a bit. It mm -hmm. really depends on the disturbance type. Okay. Um, we we have uh, what we call NDTs, and, and it's a system. A lot of places in the world use that. We call it NDTs in British Columbia, natural disturbance type. So a natural disturbance type one is a stand that has rare stand replacement events. 
So this is typical of uh, stands on the coast um, and in the interior rainforest where they just tend to fall over on each other tree by tree or small clumps by small clumps. It's rare that you get these big stand replacing events. Mm -hmm. um, and so those ecosystems can sometimes be a few thousand years old. Um, NDT3, uh, fire dominated or, or ecosystems that are typified by large stand replacing events. Um, you still find very old forests in those uh, in pockets, uh, typically around the rivers or in areas that are can't get burned too easily. And when fire goes through them, they tend not to be catastrophic, except for now in this climate change world. So they mm -hmm. might wipe out a few of the trees, but those trees all stay standing and they kind of fall on each other. So over time, you still end up with this very rich, complex ecosystem. And then, you know, NDT4, that's a stand main, fire maintained ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, it keeps burning out the underbrush. So the California redwoods, for example, is an NDT4. Uh, and if you don't keep those fires, uh, it, it'll kill everything. But if you keep it, it keeps a very complex overstory with a less complex understory and supports a range of things that you just don't get anywhere else in the world and keeps a climate that you don't get anywhere else in the world. Gotcha. So it, it just really depends. And the, the trick okay. is, is, is to try to use civiculture systems that more mimic what would go on in the NDT as part of the solution. Gotcha. Okay. Um, what, one final question to whomever might feel like answering it. So I'm trying to, I'm just trying to get it. So the, the, the main concern I'm getting, at least from the public perspective is that the, the old growth that we're really concerned about, like there's old ecosystems, there's old growth in the interior, there's old growth, but the old growth that is the big, you know, the big old trees that are, you know, they make the, make the front news when they get logged because they're, they're so massive. Right. Um, how much of that is left? That is, that is at risk of being, of, of, of being harvested. Does anybody have, is there a good inventory of that? Well, that, that is the question that, uh, Karen Price, Dave Douse, Rachel Holt, uh, asked themselves. Um, and, uh, how, how much of this old, forest capable of growing big trees exists outside of protected areas and so is in uh, a schedule to be logged. And the the answer is a very small amount indeed. And uh, that's part of the work that uh, Gary and this crew has been involved with, mm -hmm. uh, is mapping these areas and making recommendations to government. Just mm -hmm. a, a quick follow up on the, the last question because you mm -hmm. were asking if there are areas that haven't seen fire. Mm -hmm. And um, I think um, in addition to Gary's point that, that uh, the disturbance regimes are, are just so very different from our silvicultural systems over most of British Columbia, uh, it's not in any way um, mimicking what happens under disturbance regimes. But there mm -hmm. are areas... Uh, some parts of Clackwood Sound, some part of the central coast, where people have done re uh, detailed research involving uh, tree scars, uh, stand age and reconstruction and soil charcoal. And there were places that Dan Gavin and Ken Lertzman and others found in, in Tofino Creek in Clackwood Sound, for example, uh, especially at north-facing slopes uh, in fairly protected areas. Uh, that do not seem to have experienced fire since the last ice age. So there mm. are some of the very few areas in Canada that do not appear to have, have seen stand destroying or, or even stand modifying fire uh, since the last ice age. And that's really unusual. Um, mm. You know, when people talk about big trees, that's one component of it. But the big trees are accompanied by, we can grow big trees again. They're accompanied by big and small logs, live and dead trees in various stages of decay. And even if you were to walk away from one of these sites now, you might need 500 years to grow a big tree, a couple more centuries for it to fall over, for it to decay till it's soft enough to provide habitat for some of these organisms might be another four or 500 years. So even if the climate weren't changing, 
which it most assuredly is, it would probably take you a thousand or fifteen hundred years to begin to approach the structure of the forest that you'd logged in the first place. Gotcha. Gotcha. So uh how how much of this do, do we do we do we have do we don't really know. It seems like it seems like there isn't really a clear inventory of of what's out there that of this very specific and rare types of ecosystems. Is that is that fair to say? We know that there's not as much as there once was and that's about it or what? There is a very specific inventory that oh, was done okay. by Karen and Dave and others. And I, I'm going to punch okay. it over to Gary at this point, but uh, oh, okay. they, they used the VRI maps to uh, come up with very specific answers for the province. Of course, the answer you get depends on how you define big and what yeah. characteristics you're asking of the inventory, right? You get, you get caught up in the definitions. I get it. Yeah, it's a it's a complicated and very nuanced discussion to try and have and to reduce it down to we have exactly this much is is, is reductive. I get it. Um, it's, it's, it's not just the rarity. It is because um, that's important too. But then we have ancient ones and then we have areas that are – when you manage for ecosystem health, you have to manage for the amount of old growth that you keep left, old for old ecosystems. Um, you know, in a perfect world, you keep at least 70% of what would inherently occur on a landscape mm-hmm. intact. But because after that, you start getting risk to biodiversity, you start losing things until you get down to 30 and then you've reached your maximum. But, we, you know, we accept some risk and we set numbers lower than 70 um, that you have to keep an amount. You have, they have to be of sufficient size to function because there's an edge effect. Anywhere where you get an edge, you get the edges affected way into the interior of the stand, sometimes up to 200 meters, uh, probably more like 100 or so. And then you have to connect them across the landscape. And then if you use practices that mimic NDTs as well as do all this, all of those things together with practices that don't wreck soils and and water and stuff like that. You end up with a much lighter touch on the landscape that keeps the landscape healthy. And -hmm. if you keep a landscape healthy, then you stop having to. We manage for timber right now subject to constraints. And the list Mm -hmm. of constraints we have is huge and complicated Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. conflicting sometimes. And you don't even, you can't even get an accurate list in some areas, but you have to, as a manager, have to get a mm-hmm. full list of all these constraints and try to figure out how to manage that. Mm-hmm. It's a lot easier just to manage for ecosystem health and then deal with some special management areas where you've got some special things that have to be done in them as opposed to try to manage for constraints. But mm-hmm. that's a big paradigm shift and a big mental shift that we have to go through. But that's what we're trying to advocate building mm-hmm. on Andy and Crew's previous work. It's, we need to change mm-hmm. the way we think. Mm. That's interesting. That's probably hard for for, for, for people in industry to hear because I feel um like my me myself, I've only been I've only been graduated for uh ten years now. And um we're we're hammered into our head that um like we're following the research, we're following the science, we're doing sustainable forest management um and we're, we're we're managing for these for these other values not just timber right so uh, what kind of pushback um john i'm not sure how, how much how much involved you are with that but how, how much pushback are we getting from industry because i feel like industry or, or, or foresters themselves and you guys are all foresters um they all got into this because they they love the forest because they're passionate about ecosystems and plants and everything and they're probably passionate about these old trees as well, old growth, right? Like they want it as much as anybody. And so when we, when we start to push back against the industries, the way they're doing things, um, how is that coming across? Is it being met with a lot of animosity? Is it being met with, you know, head on being like, yeah, we could, we, we have room for change. What's going on? Well, I have uh, actually very little contact with the industry in the broad scale. Um, the the people that you really need to talk to about that is Kofi, the Council of Forest Industries, mm. and uh, I haven't dealt with them for ten years or more. Okay. I've tried to occasionally, but uh, don't really talk to them. 
Um, what I do sense, though, is that there is a willingness on the part of some of the foresters who are trying to manage the land to change the way that things are being done. Mm. Um, whether or not that will be um, approved by their companies is a different matter. Mm -hmm. But the foresters themselves know that the current situation can't continue mm. um, and that there has to be change and it has to be f a fairly dramatic change. Interesting. And so I know that there's a lot of people who are very interested in the ideas that uh, Gary was talking about, about a major paradigm shift in forest management. Mm. And I think there are people ready to see how they can make that work. Um, of course, there's going to be the economists and the, the business-oriented people within the industry who's going to, who are going to say, no, can't do that. We've got to continue with the current status um, because we have to make money. Although they don't seem to make very much money unless timber prices are way above current. So <clears throat> I think there, as I said, there, there is a groundswell that is saying we need to change. We need to change relatively soon, but we don't, we're not really sure what we need to be doing. Hmm. That's and that's yet. concerning, right? That's real concerning. Because it's, well, I think I, there's, I, yeah. there, there has been broad acceptance of the old growth strategy review. Okay. Um, as far as I know, I mean, Gary's probably got a better idea than I do. Um, but I think a, lo a lot of people um, in the industry have um, accepted many of the premises that are in that. Mm. And now it's really comes down to the detail of how do we implement a lot of the changes that are being suggested and how do we do so in a way that is um, going to cause as, as little disruption as possible. There is going to be disruption, mm -hmm. but it needs to hopefully occur over time. And I think what's what a lot of people forget is that in the report that Gary and Al Gawley wrote, they talked about this being a fairly long-term process there were immediate needs, there were medium term, and there were longer term. And the immediate needs are being dealt with through the panel that Gary currently is on. Um, and then we get into the long, the sort of the midterm changes that are they were suggesting in the sort of next three to five years. I don't want to take words out of Gary's mouth, <laughs> but um, the... Uh, I think it's that phase that's going to be very interesting. How do we actually change the way that forestry is practiced in this province? Mm. Once we've dealt with the uh, old growth deferrals, which are the, the pressing need right now mm. and uh, were promised some time ago. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So what's the, what being in the university, being the Dean of the faculty, I'm um, teaching students for a long time. Um, what do you gather? What kind of conversations are happening in the university around this and, you know, the new crop of foresters that are that are coming out of school? What are the conversations that are happening there and, and where are their minds at? Because I, I feel like we're always taught that we can only be – we can only harvest timber off the land if it's sustainable. That's the only way that we can ethically accomplish this goal. And that is not just in sustained yield. That is also in sustainable biodiversity and water quality and indigenous rights and governance and all of the values that we place on the landscape. And so when you come across what I'm gathering from the three of you is that the, at least to some degree in these old girl stands, it is not sustainable. And how can we continue to justify it if we know we're depleting the resource right and that's and jobs is a is a weird one because jobs come and go and i know that's hard for people to hear when that's their job right now but um there's longer term things to to worry about so i'm just curious what's going on in the university right now what's what's the word well i would say that we have been teaching for at least 20 years Mm -hmm. The sorts of things that you were just talking about, you know, sustainable forest management is about biodiversity. It's about ecosystem health. It's about water. It's about carbon. It's about meeting social needs um, and uh, ensuring that the soil is protected. Mm -hmm. What we find is that employers come along and they tell us, well, 
your graduates are great, but it takes us at least a year to knock out those silly ideas that you've put into our heads. Really? It's that? Wow. Hmm. And um, that's, I think, unfortunate. And that's something that has to change. And I think it will change over time. I think there are a younger generation that is coming through that mm -hmm. hopefully will um, not address biodiversity as being a constraint mm -hmm. or maintaining the soil as being a constraint mm -hmm. or maintaining clean water supplies as a constraint. They will see these as ecosystem services that simply have to be provided and that the timber that you can maybe get from a forest is the return on the capital that you're investing. I like that. That's how I've always thought of it. And I thought that's what we were doing. And so it's hard for me to sit here and listen to you guys be like, well, not really, <laughs> at least. And I, it, it is, it's, it's, it's hard for me, right? Because that's something that I've prided myself on and that, no, I'm in a sustainable industry and I'm doing sustainable things. And so it's hard for me to hear and I find myself getting emotionally responsive to that right and i don't know the i don't know the facts i just know what i can see right and so i that i that concept though that gary first brought up and it was it was in the review as well of of managing with these non-timber values as constraints it's a it's a concept that i've discussed in the past with with a few people um particularly the last time i did a big conversation like this on the podcast it was with uh, bob wagner Dan uh, Harrison and um, Milo Mihalovic, and we talked about managing forests for values and not not just constraining them by those values, right? What do you guys? How do you how do you see that happening? What does that look like? Because I feel that managing those other values as constraints has worked to a large degree for a long time. Um, maybe not everywhere, but at least at least from what I've seen. So, what has been missing? How would it, how would that look differently than what is happening now? And maybe I'm way off base in my understanding, and you guys are going to school me, and I would appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> but I want I want to understand what that looks like. If it's not just okay, stay away from that creek, stay away from that eagle's nest, um, avoid that that specific patch of timber because it's a good wildlife corridor or whatever. Um, how do we start to think about this in such a different way? I, I, I think, uh, you know, what John has been saying has been the model for a long time, and it's, it's right through all of the legislation. So the legislation mm -hmm. actually says for each of these values, you can manage for this value without unduly constraining timber supply. You can manage for that value without unduly straining timbers or constraining timber supply. Mm. So it's it's not a, a secret goal or objective. It's stated mm. there quite clearly in the legislation. Um, I, I think part of it is has to do with scale and context. Um, and I'll, I'll use as an example the, the land use plan that was developed for the Great Bear Rainforest. It's really difficult to address some of the concepts that Gary was talking about, about uh, ecosystem risk and percentage old forest remaining at a watershed or partial watershed scale. You need a large area like the Great Bear Rainforest, um, and those concepts of um, low risk being more than 70% remaining old forest, uh, very high risk being less than 30%. Those drove a lot of the decisions about what was going to be logged and what was not going to be in the Great Bear Rainforest. Mm. So, so I, I think that kind of concept of context is really important. We need these larger land bases. We have mm -hmm. land use plans in British Columbia, but a lot of them are in desperate need of revisiting. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is is simply the issues come up a couple of times about jobs. And this is something that's raised, of course, by the industry every time these issues are raised. Um, I think it's it's important to remember that in British Columbia, like Alberta, like right across Canada, um, uh, you know, these um, forests, these land bases are largely a public resource. Uh, we need 
treaty settlement in areas like Great Bear Rainforest. That's a government-to-government land use plan between the provincial government and the First Nations pending treaty settlements. So the, the jobs and the revenue that we hope to realize from these resources, from the magnificent forests of British Columbia, which are are globally outstanding. I think John would agree, having seen a lot more forests around the world than me. Um, the the um, all of the benefits that flow from these forests, whether they're economic or employment or simply appreciation or um, the the knowledge that you'll be passing them on to your grandchildren, all of these benefits should flow to to British Columbians in whatever way possible. And employment and revenue can certainly be generated by logging the forests. We have mm-hmm. uh, ample evidence of that. But mm-hmm. one of the premises of the, the Great Bear Rainforest Land Use Order and a lot of interesting work underway right now in a lot of different parts of the province is how can we generate employment and revenue by not logging these forests? What's important shouldn't be the volume of timber that's produced. It ought to be, if employment and revenue is what you're interested in, then employment and revenue should be your metrics. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because we're getting into this conversation about the values that old growth contains, right? And there is there is a multitude of values. And the arguments that come up when 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 we're talking about this kind of stuff I don't think anyone denies that old growth is important or anyone denies that we need clean water or, or, or solid soils or, or rich biodiversity. And it seems to be in a perspective of which one of these values is at higher risk and which one of these values is at risk of not returning or a risk of um, – it's just a difference in opinion in, in which values are, are most important. So how do, we, how do we start to break down – how would you guys – explain to somebody like, okay, this is how you should look at this old growth issue. How do we weigh out these values to decide which ones should be priority, right? Because we, we talk about, I'm not sure how many, um, first of all, I guess we should talk, I want to talk a little bit about the industry actually. Um, how many jobs, like say, say we were to stop logging, there was a deferral completely on old growth right now. Um, we do have to talk about the economy a little bit. How many jobs are lost? How many mills are affected? And how do we... Um, so uh, so yeah, there, uh, I'll, I'll start over. Um, so one of the things I wanted to get into was these values, because this is the conversation that where I think the, a dis- the disagreement comes in when talking between people, right? Is um, how do we begin to look at all the values that these old growth forests contain and weigh them in, in a way that is objective and protects the most vulnerable piece or however you want to word that, right? How do we do this objectively? How do we go about doing it? I know Gary, you were heavily involved in that review and probably had uh, spent a lot of time thinking about this, but I'm sure you all have. So um, John, do you, do you want to, do you have something you want to start with that or weighing, just weighing the yeah. objectives? How do we, how do we weigh these objectives in a way that seems, that seems, or these weigh, weigh these values in a way that is objective, right? Yeah, and to me, the fundamental value that we need to be dealing with is the state of the ecosystem mm-hmm. and the ecosystem health and resilience. And we should not be interfering in ecosystems if we're going to compromise that. Okay. So And so we need to start off with that. And I mean, when I when I look at what happens in things like the timber supply review, mm. and that they start off by saying, Oh yes, we're going to <clears throat> calculate what we can what the we can harvest in a sustainable fashion. Mm-hmm. But then there are a whole lot of little clauses that come in, and Andy will know these better than I do. But the clauses are things like we have to take into account the priorities of the province, which Mm. are invariably about jobs Ah, and votes. I see. And so we have this ecological requirement, but then it gets subsumed under other requirements, which could be, for example, maintaining the mill in a particular town. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the harvest level is raised 
to a level that is not ecologically sustainable, but mm. is will help enable that mill to survive. And so we need to move away. I think we need to move away from that because we know that the mills are going to have to close mm. in many different places. Already, we a lot of mills have closed. I think something like 80 mills or 100 mills have closed in the last 20 or 25 years. Um, <clears throat> there will likely be other mills that, well, we know there will be other mills that have to close because mm. the midterm timber supply is uh, predicts that. But if the changes that are being discussed here <clears throat> and elsewhere are brought in, there will be even bigger reductions. And we need to we need to adjust for that. We need to they're, they're going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, whether they happen in the next two or three years or in the next ten years is debatable. That's a political action, but um, they will happen. And if we start planning now and dealing with that, I think we'll be able to um, adjust more readily than if we just allow things to continue until they crash. I, I think another aspect to all of that is the question of who's going to make those decisions about how the values, which values are more important than others. And this was certainly one of the the uh, recommendations from the Gary Merkel Al Gorley review is that the, the First Nations in British Columbia be more directly involved in making decisions about the land base than they have mm -hmm. been in the past. The land use plans for Great Bear Rainforest, Haida Gwaii, uh, and even Clackwood Sound back in the day uh, were all developed as being government-to-government -government plans with the two governments being the provincial government and the First Nations government. Uh, almost all of the rest of British Columbia, the decisions were made by the provincial government. Hmm. Um, and First Nations were consulted or not to varying degrees. So mm. it, it goes back beyond what decisions are we going to make, I think, to who's going to be making these decisions. And that's certainly something we need to do a better job of in BC. Mm. Mm. You know, earlier I was speaking about a paradigm shift, and uh, there are many dimensions to this paradigm shift. Um, one of the dimensions of this paradigm shift is, uh, and I can understand why you take, uh, why it gets in your craw that you're finding out maybe that we aren't doing the job we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. But our whole way that we learn about forest management right now is from the perspective that forests exist for the benefit of humans. Mm -hmm. That is our perspective. We don't, we don't look at them as intrinsic values. We are very self-centered as a species. Everything is here for us. And what can we take? How can we maximize the benefit from it? Um, and yeah, we, you know, we speak about sustainability and stuff, but we've created a system and I want to build on what John said. We've created a system. Uh, we calculate the AAC um, using a maximization formula. And it's true that we can accommodate other things to increase it if we need to. We rarely just decrease it. That almost never happens. Uh, but we can increase it if we like. So we cut at the theoretical maximum. We set our stumpages to get the most value that we possibly can, which by default dummies down forest management because you can't spend as much on creative management when you're in a competitive system. And then we allocate our timber. We allocate every stick of theoretical maximum and penalize people if they don't take it. So, mm -hmm. so now we live in a world that's full of uncertainty and complexity. And as we learn new things, you, there's very few foresters who actually understand how to manage for ecosystem health. It's true that we may have heard something about it in school, but you know, like everybody, it's what, what you hear in school and what you actually do in life are two different things. And if everybody, <laughs> when you go out there around you is, is talking the language, but not actually doing it, then you fall into what they're doing. And we, we keep looking for these magic bullets. Oh, let's just do one more constraint. Oh, let's just set one more rule. And uh, you can't believe how many foresters we talked to that said, just give us a rule. 
Like, yeah. don't confuse me with how this land works or anything like that. Don't make me think. Just give me some rules. And I'm kind of going, well, we have kind of got like that. We we live mm-hmm. in a two hundred year old paradigm that mm-hmm. this is all about timber. Our land use planning is all about putting a bunch of people in a room and competing for different uses. Ecosystem health and land is a constraint. It's a it's a fight for who can get the most uh, concessions. I guess uh, that is historically our planning framework. Mm-hmm. And so. If you think that through just a little ways, the outcome is inevitable. The outcome that then we start to ask ourselves, okay, what value should I manage for? Which one's more important? Well, that is another way for us to kind of minimize what the land is about so that we can get more of what we want. Like we always play this little game with ourselves about trying to focus ourselves in the corners get away with this and leave all the other stuff out so that we can get what we want. That is absolutely the wrong way to think. That will ultimately come back and bite you. And if you don't take care of the land, nothing else matters. I think we should. it should be obvious to us with the effects of climate change right now. It should have even became obvious to us with PCBs and stuff that are accumulating at the poles and stuff, that we are not in control here. Even if we, it doesn't matter how much we think we are, it will come back to bite you. And John's right. We are in a place right now where there is going to be a major restructuring of the industry, regardless of whether or not we implement this report or not. We, we mm-hmm. cannot continue down this path of trying to manage for timber subject to constraints. It just does not work for the, mm. for the business, for the environment, for communities. And for all of the other industries that are forest dependent, it does does not work. We have to fundamentally change that view. And that is going to be a tough shift. The trick is involve as many people as you can in managing that transition. Try to take care of as many people as you can in sectors. Rise everybody's education and understanding about how to do this properly. And let's work through this together. That is the way it has to happen. You cannot dictate enlightenment and societal change at this scale. It just can't happen. So. Mm. Yeah. No, that's incredibly insightful. And I learned a lot there for sure. <laughs> I'll sheepishly hide my face for asking the question of how do we value these? Which one's more important? <laughs> so I appreciate the, uh, appreciate the hammer fist. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting topic, right? Because, uh, we, yeah, we're, we're, we're taught that we're doing this sustainably and that we're doing this a certain way. And then we enter the, the job market and we start to do things. And then, and you're saying like, listen, we're, we're thinking about this all wrong entirely. And no, none of you, the gist that I'm getting is like, none of you are saying like, Hey, we can't be harvesting timber. Like in my mind <laughs> done the right way, it, it's, it's potentially the only truly sustainable raw material on the planet. Um, what the right way looks like, I don't know. I'm starting to have doubts now talking to you three. Thanks a lot. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's I, I think it's 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 crucial. Like I, I was I was struck that listening to you, Gary, listening to you talk about rethinking the way we do things and not just adding another constraint to to not cut something that's over two fifty or whatever. 250 years old or whatever the constraint may be that we need to restructure the way we value the forest. And I I was struck with the idea that um, the same thing that Andy brought up was that in your report, you talked a lot about um, indigenous involvement and it was the number one recommendation. Um, And I thought that was, it was awesome because obviously it's been, you know, indigenous involvement has been, has been largely absent for a long time in in a meaningful way. And so in, in your perspective, I feel like the indigenous involvement has has more of that holistic perspective of living in equilibrium with the land and 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 not managing it just for yourself but for everything on on, the, on a broad scale. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about why you think that indigenous involvement is the number one recommendation. Why is it one of the most important things that needs to be implemented in order for this new paradigm to take place in a meaningful and productive way and by productive i don't just mean economically or whatever i mean in totality 
there were actually five uh, foundational recommendations. It's true that was number one, but the other ones are equally important um, okay. to okay. set the foundation. Um, the Indigenous one was, you know, Al and I were clear up front and we declared our bias up front. Our bias is land and people and collective wisdom, community. Um, and, uh, and both of us have that bias. Um, we, uh, we picked the indigenous one and it ended up being first for probably as much political and optics reason as anything else. But, mm -hmm. but we have legal constitutional rights in Canada that have to be upheld and, and obligations to those rights, legal obligations. So, so, I mean, that to start with, but more, we saw amazing approaches to land management in many Indigenous communities in the province because they don't think of the land the same. The ones that have developed their land ethic and started to translate that land ethic into actual management systems, there's some really innovative, common sense and practical approaches to managing land out there coming from these communities that I think is going to teach us tons. You know, I just I, I just had this conversation with a couple of provincial people. Um, well, I've had it a couple of times now, but they're really looking forward. I'm working on another project to uh, show how to actually do this on the land in the land use planning context. Um, and we're going to hopefully change provincial policy with it. I, uh, I, they're really looking forward, and this is from an Indigenous community perspective. I, we're really looking forward to this because they, they really struggle with, uh, the silos that they've created and the different processes, and none of these things talk to each other. And in fact, they compete with each other and try to undermine each other in the system, depending on who they are. They're like a microcosm of society, but it's internal to the bureaucracy. And uh, and there are so many of them who want to rise above that and start thinking whole. But the system is not built to think whole. It's built to think pieces. And uh, there's the, we have this modernized land use planning uh, thing in British Columbia. We are moving on a number of fronts to change the way we look at land. There's a number of public policy initiatives that are all pointing in roughly the same direction. Um and one of the things that they really struggle with is how do we actually look at land as a whole? Uh, like we've got all these programs and empires and bureaucracies built up that all have their own little thing. And uh, it's really hard to rise above that. It's hard to rise above sectors because they're all partitioned. Um, and so that that is the first task is to even try to think about how to do that. But then we operate, you know, we manage thousands of year old ecosystems on a four year political cycle, a political cycle that depends on votes, that depends on jobs and keeping people happy. And, you know, the perception is jobs is currency. Uh, fortunately, that perception is is changing slightly, not completely, but it's we're adding land into that. So, you know, I as the indigenous community can help us get out of that mindset and help us build a rudder along with local planning boards where people are educated, supported by proper scientists and proper uh, experts to start looking after and understanding their land base. If we can move, in our view, to a system more like that, then we become grounded a lot better in a rudder that's much more, much less volatile and much more deeply rooted in where it needs to be back into the land. That's that's our view about that. So indigenous is a crucial component from our perspective of that. And if the community, the indigenous community be, can be supported to build this ethic and build appropriate systems so that they can help lead public policy on a different kind of a mental framework, this paradigm that we're trying to do, then there's a lot to learn there. I mean, they don't know everything, but they just changing our thinking is the hardest thing we're struggling with right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like listening to you guys talk like the 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 intention is there with foresters and with indigenous people and with the public and that we all like the intention is there, but the the methodology is wrong and the we've kind of gone 
like the whole concept is that we're supposed to be doing this sustainably and we can't and our concept of sustainably is is dependent on how fast we can grow back trees and not so much the capacity of the land um then we're in trouble right like we definitely we need to be managing the forest and and removing timber at a rate that is well within the capacity of the land to to come back and it, it's it's interesting to try and even conceptualize the concept of this paradigm shift of rethinking everything is, is difficult to do, right? Like it, it almost, I could see how people would be, um, how foresters and forest managers would be, uh, I don't know. They would have a hard time accepting it. Right. Cause they, cause it would almost come across as being like, Hey, like, uh, everything you're doing is garbage. Stop doing it. You have to rethink it all. I don't think that's what you're saying, but I could see how people would respond in that way. Right. So, um how do we how, like how do we manage all of that to try and make sure that we are we are on the right path here right like you guys talked a lot about deferrals um and the deferrals are coming so what's being deferred exactly and 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 for how long do you guys know Gary knows yeah i know um i can speak about some of it but i can't speak about all of it until there's a public sure, decision sure. um mm-hmm. we are deferring um, we are working to defer harvesting in ecosystems that are at serious risk of disappearing and not being able to contribute to the overall landscape and ecosystems okay. that are crucial, ancient ecosystems, rare and unique, uh, and areas that can help us as we shift the corner to start managing for ecosystem health. Um, yeah. We will need these intact areas, and you need representation of all of them. You, you need them, mm-hmm. all of them across the landscape, connected and functioning like they should. Um, you, uh, you, you need these to help you plan how you do that. If you don't have them, there's no options. You can't grow them back. So you're really now not managing for ecosystem health. Mm-hmm. Part of our recommendations wasn't to manage every piece of land like this. We we saw mm-hmm. some of the Georgia pine plantation type areas, maybe in some areas, We, mm-hmm. but for the bulk of it, and then we see continued probably some protection areas, but for all the rest of the forest, our view was we should be managing along these lines. And even the Georgia pine plantation type model where you just have row and row and row of tree or the Swedish model. Um mm-hmm. You can do that, and you can even still manage that in a way that actually does contribute to landscape biodiversity, depending on how you do it. You can use Mm -hmm. strip shelter wood. You can use a lot of different techniques mixed in with uh, natural region and a few other things. And you can even keep complexity in some of these managed, like intensively managed forests. Farmers do this. I don't know why we can't figure it out as for I, I think it's because our rotation's too long. I mean, you look at countries uh, where they're second and third re- rotation right now, managing intensively, and they're, they're basically deserts with trees with no biodiversity and uh, very poor function and really, really struggling right now. So, like, that's not the place I don't think we as British Columbians want to go on a large scale. I don't right. think we want that. Uh, that's my view. No. And, and I don't think anybody, I don't think, uh, you know, any forester I know, some of them like that, but most of them are about the other kind of forest, the more sustainable, do what the land tells you to do kind of forest. Mm-hmm. And they just don't know probably how to accomplish this task. Like, I think there's a lot of, there's talking about, you know, managing for, you know, ecosystem-based management kind of stuff and managing for communities and for biodiversity and and trying to be more all encompassing is it this is kind of outside the scope of what we're talking about but I'll, I'll pose it to you all anyways based off of the education of the average forest manager right like how much is it fair to ask them to understand the complexity of all this and on top of that um i i think i th- Personally, I think they should like they, they, they this needs to be part of their understanding, but based off of what they do know, what they have been taught, is it reasonable to expect them to have all this knowledge or is there is there maybe a totally different system like you're talking about where we need to bring 
more people to the table, more stakeholders to the table to do this management, just just so that the the perspectives are there. Well, I mean, if I can if I can add something here, I mean, I, I think that the the current forestry education is still very much old school. Okay, um, it is defined by the professional associations mm -hmm. that define the competencies that the students are expected to have when they complete their education. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would, what I think is needed is to move beyond that. And Gary and I have been working on a program, uh, undergraduate program that hopefully will do that, but okay. it will not get accreditation under the current system. So the people coming out of that won't be able to qualify directly as registered professional foresters because they haven't done the requisite number of credits and soils or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so I, th I think in terms of education, we've got a long way to go. I think we've even further to go in terms of educating the people who are already practicing forestry. Mm. I think the majority of forgotten much of what they learned at university. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think many of them never learned what they should have learned. I would really challenge, I, mean, I, I don't know how many RPFs there are, but uh, I wonder, I think there's something like 5,000. I wonder how many of them would be able to identify more than 10 species of lichen mm -hmm. or uh, even, even fewer species of fungi other than our malaria. Andy may have a feel for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not not too many, but I, I I do think it's important to appreciate what a a complex task forest management is, and, and what yeah. a difficult task we're setting people, and why you may need a team to manage a forest. Uh, that we're asking people to have a good understanding of forest ecology, biodiversity, hydrology, um, um, geomorphology, um, uh, economics, road building, and so forth. It's, uh, it's really an impossible task. Uh, uh, Fred Bennell, I remember, used to say, uh, forestry isn't rocket science. It's way more complex than that. <laughs> <laughs> and well, that, that, you know it, it, so it gets back to your initial question i think how much do we expect of a single person it's got to be uh a team and it's got to be a combination of legislation regulations and enough mm -hmm. personal freedom to manage in a creative fashion yeah yeah well that's just it right like we we want to set people up for success and if what we're saying is, hey, coming out of university, you don't have the tools necessary to do this type of management properly, then what what do we expect, right? Like it's almost it's almost like we we don't only need a paradigm shift in in forest management, but in the way we teach it and the way we what we expect of people, and it's it's just it's it's all encompassing, and it almost sounds too overwhelming to to be realistic in a way, in a, in a pessimistic way, right? So it's I. I'm just I'm just very aware of my own education, right, and my own my own biases, my own lack of understanding of certain topics. And I know if I was a forester in BC right now, who's who was working for a company, then I thought I was doing, you know, strong, sustainable forest management. And then I hear people saying that that's not what's happening. I would have a hard time swallowing it, right, because I I, I would feel that I'd spent my life trying to do those good things, and then. So like, what advice do you guys have to people who are having a hard time swallowing these concepts? And because I, I know Gary, in your, in your review, one of the first things you said was like, hey, this is not personal towards anybody. We don't blame industry. We don't blame the, the government. We don't blame really anybody. This has been a systems problem that has been ongoing for a long time and that it's just kind of come to a head now to a point where we can't ignore it anymore. And I appreciated that perspective because you, you weren't, I think that's where people come from, right? They get they get their their guards up because they don't want to say someone to say, "Hey, you're the reason this happened." So we want to make sure that people feel okay to 
to not just turn off their minds and think, well, those people don't know what they're talking about. Like I, I've, you know what I mean? Like we want to make sure that everyone can come to the table here and feel like part of the solution and feel like there's, there's a place for them. Right. Yeah. You know, Andy talked about the complexity of managing the forest and he didn't even speak to the part that we're not really managing for us, what we're doing is we're translating public expectations into the way our forests look. And so ah, there's that yes. whole sphere of the work that we didn't even talk about that, that is there. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, so now you got one person who's expected to be a public participation expert, a forest ecologist, and a, a person who can go out and lay and run operations and maybe even run a major forest company and a whole mm -hmm. bunch of other things in a crazy environment it's 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 just way too much and uh and i um i look at it like this is a place we've all come to we did the best we could with what we knew and with the thinking that we have we don't have all the answers i mean al and i never ever subscribe to having all the answers we do mm -hmm. know from our place of who we are and our wisdom and from what everybody else told us that these are the paths that we need to go down and we need to foster this shift in thinking and as we foster this shift in thinking more and more answers will become more obvious and as we raise our level of understanding we're still relatively young in this whole concept of how do i live with land how do i take mm -hmm. care of ecosystems and from a perspective of I'm just a small part of it as opposed to it's there for me and for my mm -hmm. use exclusively and I can ignore other things. Like that that thinking is still very, that kind of extractive thinking is still very predominant in all of our society. It's not just British Columbia. I mean, Alberta has mm -hmm. the same, all of Canada has the same thinking. The U.S. has, there's very few countries in this world that don't think like that. Um, and uh, so... It's a bit of a struggle for all of us, and you may learn things. Uh, you know, I want to reinforce what was said earlier, what John said, is we've taught people this stuff. But the thing mm -hmm. is, is it doesn't matter if you learned it. Like, I, I think about when I went out, when we went out and did this old growth thing. I probably learned that stuff somewhere, too, about how these ecosystems function. And I know it intuitively and inherently, but i got to tell you, I... It was like relearning everything over again because nobody uses it. Nobody does it. There's no mm. rules out there or whatever. Nobody to teach you. It's not common knowledge. It's very few people understand this. We, we are still in the timber subject to constraints model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, just, I would, oh, sorry. Yeah, carry, go ahead. Carry on. No, that's okay. No, I go ahead. I, yeah. I, I was just going to say, I think it's important to not, um, we've been talking about how individuals have been seeing the need for change and seeing that things need to change. And I think that we always have to keep in mind that some very important and influential people in very important positions don't agree with that. I would encourage you to read read the last couple of issues of, say, Truck Logger magazine representing the opinions of the Truck Logging Association from around the province or, or anything that the Council of Forest Industries has released in the last six months to appreciate that, that uh, there is going to be an awful lot of opposition to any changes to the status quo. And in fact, the way the system's built individuals and even individual companies can't make that many changes to the current system the way it's structured. Uh, I think uh, um, I think it was Gary who referenced earlier that a, a forester can't decide, well, I'm, I'm not going to cut that old growth stand. I'm just going to leave it and, and move on because it's an important stand. Mm -hmm. uh, a company can't say, well, we're not going to cut this piece of land that's uh, been factored into our allowable annual cut. 
Um, those sorts of decisions, if, if individuals and companies start to make those sorts of decisions, I'm fairly certain the Forest Service would threaten to take those lands away from them, give them to somebody else who would cut, cut them. Uh, that's the way the system's structured right now. So, um, you know, it's important to think about the changes that need to happen, but who's going to take some leadership on these? And at a certain level, it has to be the provincial government and the First mm-hmm. Nations. So so what kind of, I, I find myself needing to try to, to bring in some of those those conversations that you guys are having with with industry folk um so what are what are some of the some of the what is some of the pushback what is what are the arguments being made because i feel i feel a need to have to try and speak a little bit of that if if we can does anybody have any specific examples that they can point to or anything if you read the sources that i mentioned there it's almost all about jobs and revenue right and the notion that we have tons of old growth, so it doesn't matter. Right, yeah. right. And and yeah. uh, with without a uh, an express recognition that even that link between the amount of wood that's cut and the amount of jobs and revenue that are generated was broken decades ago. We're still logging mm-hmm. about the same volumes of wood in British Columbia that we were about 30 years ago. We're simply employing about half the people to do it and generating way less revenue. So, right. you know, cuts, redu- reductions in cut or increases in cut don't translate directly to reductions or increases in employment, even within mm-hmm. the forest industry. And a lot mm-hmm. of people are starting to say, well, um, you know, is there a way that we can generate employment and revenue by not logging these forests? And there's lots of innovative solutions being proposed right now. Mm, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's a, it's a, it's a, I, so so basically, the argument behind the jobs and revenue is, is is being pushed by this notion that there is still plenty of old growth. Is that being misguided by that 13.2 million hectares that was toted by the government, and that it's really not that much because most of it is inoperable or unproductive and will never be used anyways like it seems like there's almost a misunderstanding of the fundamentals of this argument then if that's the case i don't think anybody who's looked at the numbers has a misunderstanding of the fundamentals i don't think okay. the the people at the council of forest industries really think that there's 13 million hectares of forests that anyone will ever log of old growth okay. forests that people will I wouldn't think so either because they, they, they all have inventories, right? They still right? So. use the numbers. Um, mm. And a lot of people still repeat them. Mm. The I, other just, part, I just feel like there has to... Go ahead, sorry. The other part is that, um, like, you know, what do they say? Liars figure and figures lie or whatever. There's a some statement like that. <laughs> <laughs> these, these are all the same numbers. It's just how you portray them and which parts you choose to use. And, you know, everybody's everybody's kind of right and kind of wrong in the same time. Um, yeah. And one of our recommendations was that we need to start to try to raise the public awareness of what's really what's real and what's not uh, or or just facts, just getting facts out and letting people sort this out like a good picture of this is all of the old growth and the different categories and you know what's at risk and but all this stuff and a better explanation all the questions you asked earlier and having that information available to everybody so that we don't keep playing this game it uh you know i would argue that we dummy down forest management because of and and land management in general but particularly forest management because it's an all or nothing game I either protect it or I use the heck out of it. Well, ah. but nobody really thinks about the land uh, and like, what can I do with it and how can I take care of it properly? If I was doing that right in a way that was protecting ecosystem, I, we frankly believe, Al and I, that our operable forest land base would increase significantly. But if you open uh-huh. an area up, it's automatically cleared. And 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 I we see. still have progressive clear cuts in British Columbia. We've seen the pictures. 
they're still happening. And we said we outlawed those a long time ago, but we didn't. We have, we, uh, so, so that's what people are worried about. It's an all or nothing game. So it, it, nobody has time to think about ecosystem. You just have time to think about what can I get my hands on? And, and then I hang on to it as hard as I can. And the other side's uh, all about how much can I get out of it? Like how much can I take away from them so that they don't do that? That's just not a way to manage forests. It's not even talking about the land. It's just, it's, it's dealing with something completely different. And frankly, for me, dummies down the whole thing too much, way too much. Mm. Mm. Yeah. No, that's, yeah. No, it's a, it's an incredibly, to your point, I had to have a conversation with, with you three to try and understand the figures and, and, and try and clarify in my own mind what's going on with old growth and that kind of thing. Um, Cause yeah, I feel like there isn't really a clear picture. There's, there's kind of, there's three or four different pictures coming at the public and they don't know what to take seriously. What to, what is, what is accurate? Cause it, it feels like there isn't this, this, there's no place for the government to go to get a contextualized and perhaps comprehensive perspective on this. It's just, it's just, it's one bias versus the other almost. And it's hard to navigate. So yeah, I think there's definitely, I, I, I believe, I think you're right. I think there's definitely a huge amount of value in maybe trying to, do more public involvement or, or public consultation or just, just trying to clarify a little bit with some infograph or something, right? Like people like pie charts. I like pie charts. Like, like how much of this is what? And like, yeah, like it, it, I know it seems like you said, it takes away maybe from the complexity a bit, Gary, but I also feel it's, it's absolutely crucial that not just the public, but forest managers understand what's going on. Cause I th- it sounds to me like there's, there's, there's a misunderstanding in in what is actually happening. Like there's, it's not clear, right? It's concerning. There's actually something really fundamental here that I'm not sure has been entirely addressed in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And that is the quality of the forest inventory in British Columbia leaves a huge amount to be desired. Mm. The, we've talked about the VRI or Andy mentioned it earlier. Um, there's a lot of inaccuracies in that, and its value for recognizing old growth is quite questionable. Um, if if you don't know what's out there, how can you possibly manage it well? Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. so I think a fundamental thing that is needed here is a good quality inventory that is fully updated using the the best available information. And I don't think we have that right now. Really? With a proper mm. classification of old growth. The, yeah. the inventory was built for timber. It wasn't built for managing for ecosystem and ecosystem health. So, you know, anything over 250 years old is just in one big lump. And and as we as stands increase in age, we found in our work, the error becomes much more significant on that age estimate. Um, mm. And uh, where it starts to become almost unreliable at a certain point. And so that portion of the inventory in particular really needs to be, we need to work on some classifications along the line that Andy spoke about. Longer term thinking about what do we really need to understand about these areas and their importance and start to map that out and map from a different perspective if we're going to manage for ecosystem health it, the inventory was just never built for that job interesting so what would you like included in the inventory in order to suss out that detail what 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 i was curious what what's missing from it to accomplish that goal well there there's different approaches and i think that's something people need to spend a lot of time thinking about before you decide to come up with some sort of provincial system, but it wouldn't be one that's primarily a timber inventory. It would be sure. one that that better represents things that are everything that's important to us. Uh, we have uh, ecosystem mapping, uh, or you had asked about VRI, that's the Vegetation Resources Inventory. Gotcha, uh, but okay. that's that's actually forest cover maps essentially uh, but we okay. also have for 
parts of the province, ecosystem mapping, terrestrial ecosystem mapping, um, or predictive ecosystem mapping, which maps the uh, site series in our provincial ecosystem classification. And that's been more useful for some purposes, uh, like wildlife management, for example. So I think some classification system along the lines of terrestrial or predictive ecosystem mapping that is a uh, an ecosystem classification rather than a classification built for any particular management purpose I see. might be more I broadly see. applicable to everything from wildlife management to recreation to perhaps even timber. Mm. It's surprising to me that that doesn't already exist. I feel like the technologies are there and the to to suss out that information, but that's yeah. It's a little more complex than sorry. It's a little more complex than that, though. And, and you know, habitat mapping is a good example. I think that's actually a good example. Um, we we can know physical attributes, but there's a there's a certain amount of interpretation involved here too, based on the attributes in the mapping, and it's the same for ecosystem. We can we can know the age of the trees. We can know the age of the ecosystem, like since it was last disturbed. Uh, we can make an estimate of that. We can look at tree size, uh, growth rates, a few other things that are useful parameters. But then we have to start coming up with indexes around um, um, biodiversity and having classification systems for that, the inherent biodiversity the inherent mm. connectivity and importance in connectivity in a landscape. You have to start coming up with things like wildlife habitat mapping that take the core information, some of which we don't have in the system, and use that to start to infer and categorize in, in new ways. Then you've got an inventory that speaks to you about ecosystems and the value of those and the relative importance in the landscape and uh, and uh, they're all important at some level, but it kind of gives you more more of that kind of information. Hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. So, who do you, who is the onus on to start accomplishing these types of things? The recommendation was to government, and that was one of the recommendations. Right. Yeah. No, and that makes sense, right? It's a public resource. If if we want to start. They can't do it. Sorry, they can't do it by themselves. They need help. They need right. They need obviously a lot of science based help. I frankly think that uh, again, the indigenous community, particularly those who've lived on the land quite a bit, can help them a lot with this, as well as other multi generational landowners, because this is not purely a science exercise. There is a lot of wisdom involved in this as well. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like it sounds like the ultimate version of forest management, right? In that we're, hey, let's have an exact amount of how much all of these values exist on the landscape, where they are, to what extent, to what degree, how vulnerable they are. And then let's apply this incredibly complex algorithm to tell us what we should do by valuing these values and and figuring out which one in which situation takes precedent, right? It's like a, it's a it's That's it's like the ultimate making. thing that I, <laughs> right. It's, it's it sounds like the thing that we want. That's what that we're we trying want, to do right ultimate. now. Yeah, I know it's awesome. I love it. It's it's a great idea. So in the interim, in the interim, while we're trying to move towards that concept of just <laughs> of, of of having it ultimately be the best it could possibly be. Uh, what do we do? Like you said, we defer the, defer the cutting of old growth management or of old growth. Um, and then, Gary, you, you broke down, um, and, I, and, I, and I know that the review is taking up a lot of the, the time in this conversation, but I feel the review that you and Al did was very comprehensive and very fair in that you included everything and you were also very open about your own biases throughout it. And you laid out this, this three-zone management option right yes. in which it was protected uh i forget constrained and, and consistent i don't have uh what is it is that right yeah 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 uh, it was uh, so can you yeah can we talk about uh, i wanted to 
yeah, I want, I want to talk about this three zone management system um, and, and maybe go into it and then I'll ask my questions after you've kind of explained what it is and what your recommendations were. So, um, you know, if I, in our in our perfect world, Al and I probably would have only had two zones, but uh, but I don't think we can get rid of the protected zone. Um, you know, I operate by a philosophy, and uh, and it's uh, the reason we make parks is because we can't trust ourselves to look after land. Uh, I love that so and, much. That's uh, so good, <laughs> and it's true because the reason we protect areas is because we can't trust ourselves. We don't know how to look after land, right? Um, so, so we have to do that to protect ourselves from ourselves. Um, and, uh, but we have areas that are protected and they're all done now. So just carry on with those. And then there's two zones left. And one, one area, what we're saying is that there is some areas now that are at a stage where there may be a couple factors that help you identify these. One factor might be is that in terms of landscape health and, bi- and contribution to biodiversity and in terms of impacts on biodiversity risk, we can manage those like an intensive management situation and not have that big of impacts because they're not that crucial in the land base. But then there's these other areas where we have fundamentally compromised them and it might make sense to just manage those intensively from this point forward too. That doesn't mean that we have to build them like rows of grass, like a farm. We can add some structure and complexity. We can manage some attributes in those areas to make them function a bit more like the older ecosystems around them over time and stuff. But the likelihood of us getting those back in the near term is uh, is highly unlikely. So they can contribute to overall landscape ecosystem health in some ways and then the rest we manage uh for ecosystem health Mm -hmm. that that is the thing and we use all those management tools and techniques ecosystem health being the primary driver the protected and the intensive management can still Mm -hmm. contribute to that but there's these ones that that's what we're managing for that's our thinking Mm -hmm. Uh, that was really more of what i'd characterize as a transitional recommendation because our mm-hmm. gut feeling was is that if we ever get to a pure, a proper ecosystem health paradigm and manage that way, this zoning will kind of fall away a little bit, frankly. It'll start to go away. But at least for now, mm-hmm. it helps us get there. I see. <clears throat> so just safety measures. Kind of. Yeah, I, I characterize them a bit like that. Yeah, it's a way of mm-hmm. working with it so it makes it more practical, I guess, for folks. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Because to me, um, I, I'm 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 always I'm always curious and and kind of skeptical of the idea of I I I don't necessarily think that human that like say harvesting or whatever can't be treated as another type of of disturbance. That is, I, I feel like harvesting done correctly doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily taking away from the landscape. It's not fire, right? Like we say, we're mimicking natural disturbance. It's not fire. It's not that we know that, but it's its own disturbance. Right. And is it not, is it not, I feel like it's, it's possible to treat harvesting as its own unique thing, a unique opportunity on the land base to, to do something specific. And I don't think harvesting it and regrowing, what was there is necessarily turning it into, you know, a purely anthropomorphic version of a forest. I feel like there is, there is real, like after a certain amount of time, there is a real ecosystem that's back on that landscape, you know? And so it's, I I like, I like that. That's, that's kind of where you were going with it, right? You're saying like, Hey, like this is a a temporary opportunity for us to change what we've done. So we can just kind of take a real inventory of everything and understand it. And then maybe we can get back to opening up those boundaries and, and having a more, a uh, nuanced understanding of the impact we're having. So that makes sense. I I don't disagree with you. It, it's just mm-hmm. not what we do. Sure. That, uh, so- that, that, uh, it, it, of course it would be possible. Of course we should be, uh, growing wood. 
uh, in British Columbia and growing and harvesting wood on some sites. And, and of mm. course, we should be trying to design silvicultural systems so that the forest we regenerate isn't 100% different in all aspects from the forest that we cut down in the first place. Um, mm. We just don't do that. Really? Oh, no, uh, that's no. not the world that I'm in. I wouldn't have thought that. I would have thought that they, like the, the, the people that I speak to, and obviously I'm biased in my own sense, I, I get the sense that, you know what I mean? These, these forests do come back to a, to a, to a semi-natural state. Obviously if you plant it, it changes things a bit. So what am I, what am I missing there? What's. Well, um, I, yes, uh, we don't deforest a lot of areas. They all come back as forest. Um, taking the forests that uh, a lot of the arguments are about on the coast and in the interior wet belt, you take a forest that's got generally big trees and small trees, live trees and dead trees of a variety of different species with lots of horizontal structure as well, lots of uh, coarse woody debris, lots of snags and things like that. And you reduce it to a forest that has uh, a much greater density of live trees, no dead trees, sure. no possibility of generating any more decaying wood on the ground, all about the same size, all about the same age, and sometimes even almost all the same species. So it's it's not like people are deforesting these areas, mm -hmm. but they probably couldn't create a a second growth forest that was more different in structure and composition than the forest they logged if they tried. Really? Yeah. Huh. You know, and that, that principle, actually, what Andy just said, you think that's maybe only the coast. It's actually not true. You mm -hmm. go into an area post-fire, it doesn't look anything like a clear cut, especially about five years later. It looks nothing like a clear cut. There's patches of hardwoods, patches of live, patches of standing. There's incredible complexity and structure left there for that to start from. And then over time, as that happens multiple times over a landscape, you end up with pockets of just incredible rich kind of things. You end up with patches of clear. You end up with all this variation which inherently supports a much wider range of species, tree types, plant types, and everything else, which inherently makes it more resilient to, to effects of bugs and pathogens and climate and a whole bunch of other things. So, yeah, I, yeah. And, and it's funny because, you know, I just wanted to say, uh, there, there is some really good work on people who are mimicking uh, NDT3 patterns, and uh, it's really interesting to watch. But NDT4, uh, Interior Douglas Fir, um, we have fire maintained stands in uh, Interior Douglas Fir, and uh, the convention was to clear cut them for a long time too. And the same thing is going on now with cedar on the coast. Um, and, but the openings that they leave are way too hot to regenerate again because they just get baked. It's the same problem now with cedar on the coast because of climate change. And so the forest, what it did was it maintained itself with enough of an overstory that the little trees could come back underneath it and it kept regenerating and some of them survived the fire. Well, we're going to have to start thinking about that kind of thing in a lot of other areas. Cedar on the coast is one example. There's a few other species in other areas because of climate change. We're going to have to really fundamentally change a lot of our civil culture systems and, and much more closer mimic what nature is doing and what we expect it to do into the future. Hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's, it's an interesting uh, notion for sure. It's not one that I'm totally privy to, so it's 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 kind of new. It makes sense, like when I when I just think about it logically speaking. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's very no, interesting. It totally changes you're the supposed way. to know everything and how to be sustainable in all dimensions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Hey, Gary, I'm the, I'm an expert here, don't you know? Like, <laughs> but yeah, I, I it, it's it's interesting to to break it down in that sense because there's. Just there's there, there's there's so many different angles to try and come at this from and to try and do it appropriately and this and this concept of old growth management, um, 
yeah, like it, it's 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 so overwhelming to the extent that even after this two hour conversation, I still don't know what to ask you guys. <laughs> 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 but so ultimately, I'll, let's talk about the future. You've talked about this three zone management kind of thing. I want to talk about. I want to. I want to. You guys to talk about how you envision the future of old growth management, the future of forestry in British Columbia, and contextualize that with AAC, with how much harvesting you expect that they're, they're that that is sustainable in the landscape. Because of course, there's a lot of plans out there right now that say that hey, we're harvesting sustainably in a lot of areas, and 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 we're okay. So to combat that, you have to have some pretty strong evidence that what's happening is not sustainable right so i want to i want to i just want to know how you guys envision it and then how much aac do you think how much annual allowable cut is okay how much of it is sustainable and obviously i'm not expecting you guys to have an exact number but how much of a reduction will the industry have to commit to do you think i don't think we have those numbers no 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 Um, but you think the, it'll be a reduction, oh, yeah. though. And what, what you haven't really discussed at all is climate change and the implications of climate change for all of this. Sure. And in particular, in the interior, if you look at the areas that have burnt over the last 10 years, mm-hmm. we're seeing an increasing proportion of the land base cumulatively mm-hmm. that has experienced serious fires. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that is only going to increase. It's not going to decrease with the mm-hmm. way climate is going at the current time. Yep. So we're... That's going to have huge impact on the AAC because the majority of the AAC is in the interior, not on the coast. Yeah. Um, in terms of coastal AAC, um, I think a lot will depend on what comes out of the work that Gary is doing at the moment. Mm-hmm. I think a lot is going to depend on the extent to which we shift towards a more ecosystem-based management approach um, as opposed to the current approach. Um, I suspect we'll see fewer and fewer clear cuts in the future um, or else the size will uh, come down substantially. Mm -hmm. Uh, In Switzerland, a clear cut was defined as two tree lengths. Ah. And that was the maximum size of gap that could be created in a forest. It's a little bit different still in British Columbia. Well, that's a a little bit different as well because like if if like primary successional species – require some space to get enough sunlight to come back properly. Right. So there, there's needs to be definitions there as well. Right. Clear definitions about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause like we don't, we don't want to go back to the system of having roads permanently all over the landscape and, and not turning them over because we have to do selective logging with a quote unquote light touch. Right. Like there is a, there is a system in there that requires us to like, like Gary said, there needs to be some, some openings there needs to be some uh you know more selective maybe understory protection logging going on there needs to be a, a patchwork of these things um and so yeah i'm just curious well, how you guys envision the future of, of forest management right well i think that's a very different question from your question about the allowable annual cut or at yeah, least sure. timber <laughs> supply um, you're right. You're right. I shouldn't. And, I shouldn't have simplified it so much. That was a terrible way to do it. I'm not perfect, you guys. I'm trying to my best here. Okay, but, but this is I, not a comfortable I, I, place I for that, me to try know, to ask the, questions the, for. Yeah, the, those kind of <laughs> questions depend on on the answers to all of the things that we've been talking about this afternoon, yeah. and the the uh, amount of wood that is allocated to timber supply ought to be what's left over after you've dealt with these ecosystems as ecosystems rather than as a source of fiber for the mills. Mm -hmm. And you should, you know, you you need to look at all the values that we associate with these things. And they include Mm -hmm. the, in my mind, they also include things like the inherent values of ecosystems. Just because we Mm -hmm. don't particularly put a human value on it doesn't mean that it's without value. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, once that exercise is complete, then we can look and see what timber is going to be available, what, you know, for, for other purposes. But I think one Mm -hmm. of the, 
one of the things that makes this so difficult to grapple with in British Columbia right now is a point that that Gary touched on earlier, which is there is no slack in the system. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you you can't say, well, let's take some of these productive forest stands that are in the timber harvesting land base and we'll put them in deferral or we'll put them aside as a, an area we're not going to log because all of those areas are currently scheduled for log logging and the rate of cut uh, is premised on logging all of those areas. We can't mm-hmm. even say we're going to cut them different ways and extract a smaller volume from each stand because mm-hmm. the determinate, well, the, the calculation of timber supply is premised on removing a certain high percentage of the volume from each of those stands. So there's there's really not a lot of slack in the system right now for dealing mm-hmm. with these different things. Uh, Alex Woods up in northwestern BC has done some really good work on this, along with Dave Coates and others, looking at assumptions about forest stands uh, once they reach a state that we refer to as free growing in British Columbia when the the responsibilities of the company are gone, the the trees are considered to be free of competing vegetation. And all of the Mm. provincial models assume that in a certain number of decades, those trees will be available for logging once again. It's just an assumption. And Alex Mm. and some others set out and actually measured them. And there's a certain percentage of those stands that never make it to maturity. Mm-hmm. The All of the timber supply um, uh, arithmetic assumes that they will. Mm-hmm. But uh, th- there's really no slack in the system for things like that. Mm-hmm. I'll give you... No, I can, I can I, understand that. I'll, I'll give you an example, actually, of what Andy just said. A friend of mine... Um, he was the chief forester for Alpac, and uh, he decided he was going to do a logging system that mimicked uh, um, NDT3, fire-dominated ecosystem in the boreal. And uh, this is similar to a system that they've actually implemented in the U.S. right now, um, okay. where when you look at a landscape, it's quite complex. Um, I'll explain the U.S. one first. They found that the coefficient of variation, once you got beyond a thousand acres, didn't change. So they divided the landscape up into thousand acre chunks, cut and planted some with various mixed species, left some for natural, left a bunch, used a variety of systems and tried to leave it as complex as the next thousand acre chunk next to it. And then worked their way across the landscape in chunks according to a pattern. My friend in Alpac did a very similar thing with the boreal forest. He divided his land base up into chunks, operational chunks. He taught his fellow bunchers how to harvest so that it looked like a post-fire landscape when they were done. Um, and he just sent them out there, and they took what they got. And it turned out to be remarkably stable over time. And they had to pick up wood from other places because Alpac's a big company. It's got big processing mm-hmm. stuff. So that means now you can't build production facilities for our production facility. Our production capacity in this province has been as high as 150% of the AAC. It's never less than a hundred. So, mm. so you can't be building that because there's just not enough to go around to do that. Plus we export a bunch. So that's not available either. And then, and then we, we, we just, uh, we have to, Think about AAC in a different way. It's not what mm. we could theoretically take from the land. It's what the land gives you after you take care of it. Ah, I like that definition. I I think that's what people think that's what's going on, right? But but it's, it's no, it's not what's like going you said, on at it's, all. It's not even it's based off of right. It's based off a lot of assumptions, like Andy had mentioned. That's interesting. And well, the people who make those assumptions are interested in getting that number as high as they can. So, 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 what have we missed in this conversation, you guys? What What do you guys think needs to be out there for for people to understand regarding the old girl conversation that we haven't yet got now? What questions should should I have asked you that I haven't? 
Any options? I'm sure you guys got plenty to say. <laughs> I think there's a good question around. It's the question around why old growth? You know, when we, we've talked about a much bigger system issue, right? Yeah. Old mm-hmm. growth is purely just a flashpoint. But it's a critical mm-hmm. flashpoint because it's so important for ecosystem health. If you're going to, if you make a choice that you are going to manage for ecosystem health, it's absolutely crucial for that. If you're going to yeah. make a choice that you want to turn uh, the entire province into managed forest, uh, row on row monocultures, similar to what Andy spoke about, then that's one choice. And that is the choice that we made by default. Hmm. But we are realizing that that choice is causing us um, a lot of grief because those forests aren't as resilient. They aren't coming back nearly what they thought. We are going into areas and using conventional methods of just clearing land and ignoring almost all the other values that are there. We are displacing a number of other industries. Uh, and somehow, I don't know why, but a forest job must be worth about 20 times a regular job. Because if you lose a forest job, it's the end of the world. If you shut down a bunch of other operators, it doesn't seem to be any big deal. Uh, that always kind of puzzled me. Um, and then and, and ended a lot of people's ability to sustain themselves off the land. Uh, so, you know, if it, it, this conversation is about old growth, but it's really actually more about how do we live with the land and look after it, right? And old growth is just a critical component of doing that. There are a number of others, but that is one critical aspect. Absolutely. Yeah. John, do you have something to say there? I just see you. You feel like you're, you look like you're struggling with something. <laughs> I, I was thinking about what Gary was saying, um, and also about your question, which I've now forgotten what the question was. Me too. <laughs> um, but, um, I do. I do see there are going to be some fundamental changes occurring in forest management, and we talked about you know what, why the emphasis on indigenous earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, why the emphasis on First Nations. I believe that um, in a province like BC, where 95% of the land is ostensibly managed by the province, we'll see more and more land either being directly controlled or co-managed by First Nations. And um, we've seen this happen in Australia. We've seen this in New Zealand. We've seen it elsewhere. The, it's going to be more and more the traditional occupiers and owners of the land that dictate what is going to happen to that land. Mm-hmm. And it's going to differ. And there's no such thing as the, the indigenous view or no. the Aboriginal view. There's multiple right. views. And we've seen that on Vancouver Island. There are disputes within communities. And there will be disputes, I'm sure, over the management of forests and over the proposed deferrals. Um, I think we'll also see some I, – I, I'm really fascinated to see what happens in the next weeks once the deferrals are announced. I don't think we'll see an end to the demonstrations that are occurring mm-hmm. because those demonstrators have said they want to see all old growth harvesting – however they define it, ended in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And so the political pressure is going to continue. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be really interesting to see how long the politicians and the government are going to put up with the sort of demonstrations that uh, they're seeing at the moment. And he's a politician. I'm sure he wouldn't really want people demonstrating on his lawn every day (laughs) <laughs> uh, for a year now, and it's going to continue into the future. Yeah. You know, eventually something breaks, and that could, you know, if we're talking about def- only deferrals at this at the current time, you know, what's going to happen to those deferrals? How many of them will become permanent mm-hmm. um, and turned into reserves? Um, and then, what's going to be the future of those? Mm-hmm. Because we saw in Australia, for example. 
there were all the reserves that were created on the Great Dividing Range, mm -hmm. and something like 80% of them burned two mm -hmm. years ago. They lost the majority of the biodiversity values that they were uh, there for. Mm -hmm. um, there were estimates of billions of dollars of billions of animals killed um, by those fires. Yeah, uh, we're not going to have fires to that extent on the coast. We hope, in certainly in the short term, but there will be other disturbances, and we will see windstorms and everything else. Mm -hmm. And how do we manage that? And how do we manage it in the interior where we do have fires? So I think there's going to be a lot of very interesting developments happening in the mm -hmm. coming uh weeks and months mm -hmm. absolutely i think i think that's an excellent point i think forestry industry has has been able has has had relatively abysmal public involvement like even though they're supposed to be right they just there's no there's no there's no um there's not a lot going on to help the public understand how lands are being managed. And that's part of the the problem as well, right? Is that the transparency that's supposed to be there doesn't seem to exist in the way it's supposed to. Um, and whose fault that is, I don't know. That's not my decision to make. But but it's it's throughout the series, throughout this whole podcast, not just this episode, but all a lot of episodes that I've done, that's a common theme that comes up, right? Is that is that industry needs to be more transparent even though they're not technically hiding anything they're just they're but they're not explaining it they're not they're not having their their methods and known and, and explained and the public is just in, in kind of the dark around the whole thing so um yeah it's definitely i i i feel you there for sure yeah yeah i i i, 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 I would just echo john's sentiments i would like to see what changes are going to be implemented. I hope the government embraces the recommendations of Gary and his group. Um, mm -hmm. it, from my point of view, this is a, a, a pressing issue, uh, both because of the public demand, but also because of the urgency of the situation um, and the irrevocability of some of the decisions that are being made right now. If you make a bad decision about don't know interest rates you can change your mind next year if an old growth stand is logged then it's gone um mm. i think in a lot of ways i am uh, not holding my breath um so far i hope i'm not being unfair uh there's really no practical on the ground difference in how the current government manages land use and forestry than how the previous governments managed land use and forestry. Um, and I'm hoping that will change. Uh, in a lot of ways, we are, um, the, the management of old growth forests hasn't changed that much since we were deliberating uh, how we ought to proceed on this file in the early 1990s. And I, I am hopeful that uh, Gary's uh, uh, sage recommendations to cabinet will be implemented and we will see something coming from this government because I absolutely believe that Ferry Creek and a lot of other Ferry Creeks, which are likely to erupt sometime soon, is happening because a lack of of a lack of uh, leadership from the provincial government on this issue. Gotcha. So I, I, I sincerely hope John is right that we're going to see some leadership from the new Democratic Party government. I hope they embrace the, the recommendations that Gary has been making to them recently. And, mm -hmm. uh, but they, they've been, uh, uh, they haven't followed through on promises so far, so I'm hoping that this will be a, a, a the leadership I've been waiting for. Gotcha. So, uh, Gary, to, uh, to talk to, to to ask you one final question here: um, How well received is your review so far uh, across across everyone that's received it from you know from the government to ngos to industry to to first nations to everyone how what what's the what's the feedback like 
Um, you know, I've, uh, it's been surprisingly positive in that, uh, well, government has adopted the recommendations in their entirety. Uh, I don't, I don't question their intent. Um, reality and intent are always sometimes different things or not always, but sometimes they, they fully understand what Andy just said, you know, Andy and crew built a, old growth strategy 25, almost 30 years ago now. And if we, if we had implemented that, we would not be in the trouble we're in now. We're backed into a serious corner. Uh, We heard from every, the surprising thing that I found when we did the review was the overwhelming consensus that something has to change. This is not working Mm. for any of us. And that came from every sector we had one industry person that I can think of who stood on the stereotypical, there's, this is all crap and you guys are all full of BS and uh, nothing, this is all good and everything. Everywhere else, uh, in fact, uh, you know, I, some of the major uh, leaders said, we know this has to change and we know it's going to be a difficult change. And I'm really looking forward to something much more sustainable and much more um, respectful of the land in the future. Um, And uh, so we've had resolutions passed by the first nations organizations supporting this a hundred percent. Um, I've had calls from truck loggers and industry folks. I work with all these people. They all are going, that was, that was a really good piece of work. We really believe in it. The transition is the hard part. How do we get from here to there? That's the key. And, uh, as I mentioned before, our recommendations are to involve people who are affected by this in the transition. And everybody said to us, we don't want another thing imposed from the center. We want to work through this, considering our local situations and doing what we need to. Government can set some pretty high level and bold um, targets or objectives that people have to meet. But let us figure it out and give us the support to do that. Give us the scientists. Give us the 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 uh, the the people who got the smarts to help us work through this, the planners, the community developers, etc., and, and the support. If we need to retool, give us that support. Um, mm-hmm. That's the part that uh, really, at this stage, I don't feel comfortable with in terms of it um, being done as quickly as it can. And I appreciate that COVID is really throwing a wrench into things. I mean, we. We tabled this. Uh, the last meeting I had with Al was March 11th. Uh, my next day was my wife's birthday. I, I, we had it in Vancouver, last face to face. We did the whole rest of it on virtual and tabled this for the end of April. And in that period, we had all the travel restrictions happen and then everything shut down. And, and so we just have not had the, the ability, I think, before now to really sink our teeth into this properly in the way that we could have if we didn't have to work through virtual for the first year and a half or whatever. And it, it's taken all of us a long time to become effective at this environment. I got to tell you, yeah, it's okay. only in the last few months that I've really started to get good at this. And I've been running complex things lately and doing some amazing things. But but it took us a long time to actually be able to have really good public policy and shift things in this environment. And I, I, I wouldn't say we're there yet, but in the first mm-hmm. year, I think we were all just fumbling idiots, frankly, of learning how to push <laughs> button do you have to push and how do I have to do this, you know, yeah, let yeah. alone having constructive breakouts and facilitated and mediated sessions and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I feel I can't imagine the the challenges that you must have encountered when trying to do something as comprehensive and big as this, right? So it's it's uh yeah, it's it's a pretty impressive document what you managed to accomplish here. Like you've you've you basically covered the entire province and and gathered as much information as possible and turned it into something that I feel is a very uh a very reasonable breakdown of the situation, right? Like it's there's no 
there's no waving pointing fingers or there's no uh everything is considered in in context it seems and i just i loved it it was it was it was great to go through so that's um, all al yeah he's way smarter than me (laughs) 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 well you guys you have thoroughly challenged my perspective on everything and i loved it it was awesome it was a cool opportunity to learn and to and to collect your guys's collective knowledge and 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 try to incorporate it into my own reality my own understanding of of what we're doing and how we can be better and how we can grow as a society and everything else and um yeah this was uh so much more than i anticipated <laughs> so uh yeah i hope uh, i hope you guys found it to be a productive or at least interesting opportunity i enjoyed it i know i know everyone listening is gonna gonna appreciate it so uh do you guys have any final thoughts anything you want to finish with or are you uh you feeling content with what we've discussed <laughs> i'll take that as a yeah we're good yeah. No, I, I, <laughs> two I, hours I, and 26 I minutes thing here i can't see. absolutely yeah yeah i can't see my picture but uh this uh we built this poster hoping it would show up on a few walls over time i only printed like, right it's yeah, it's uh, it's what it's in the back or the, it's in the, front the very cover. front of yeah the front cover of the review that you wrote. It's the uh, second page there. It yeah, describes everything. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll make sure to put the. I might even if it's okay with you. I do need a I do need a photo to represent this conversation. Um, I was probably just going to use like a stock photo of like an old cedar forest or something, but um, I'll make sure to put the. I'll make sure to put the link to your review in the in the show notes and um, whatever other resources you guys think should be included in the show notes. I will I'll put them in there uh, so people can access them and they know where this stuff is coming from. And uh, I'll make sure to if I have the permission. I'm not sure if I have to talk to you, Gary, or to Al, or who it is, uh, but maybe I'll use that uh, that picture. That you that you mentioned that diagram in some of the social media stuff and that you um, can use whatever you want. It's all good. Okay, yeah, it's all okay. good. Sounds it's good. All public. Perfect. Right. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Um, that was like I said, that was enlightening for sure. It was definitely uh, it was definitely an all encompassing conversation. We went from old growth to how do we change everything? <laughs> we scaled so, we scaled back our work. Believe it or not. Some people said you oh, went yeah? too far, and a lot of people said you didn't go far enough because there's so many other factors. Yeah. Oh, I believe so it. There you go. I believe it. That's the nature of force I, I, management. It's not rocket science, yeah. right? Like Fred says. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's way harder. <laughs> yeah. Woo! How something, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'm going to be listening to this one over and over to try and uh, sort it out because there's a, there's a lot there. So thanks for listening. I hope you like it. Share it with your friends and family. Put it on social media. Get it out there. This is a very full context conversation and um, I think people need to hear it. So thanks a lot for listening. Make sure to rate and review. Um, shoot me an email, yourforestpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, I'll get back to you with any questions you got. So I look forward to the next time. Take it easy. Catch you later.